Good morning. It's uh, 8 o'clock. It's time for the House Insurance Committee to begin. Um, when I asked on call on Representative Taylor, she would to open us with a word of prayer. And that you're on 23, 23, 23. There you go. Please bow your head. Good morning, Father. Thank you for the day you've given us. We thank you for the blessings in our lives. We ask you to give us wisdom, moderation, and justice as we look at those bills today. We ask you to carry us through this day and make the right decisions for the people of Georgia. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Welcome. Good to have each of you here this morning. We, um, for those of you on the committee, we have uh, with us uh, John King, the uh, insurance commissioner. I know some of you have met him, but not all of you have. Uh, where is... Mr. King, there you are. I'm sorry, I lost you there in the audience. If you would please, just um, if you could uh, go to the podium there just as soon as you can step there. And uh, let's see, introduce yourself to our committee members and say a few words. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of, the, of this very important committee. Obviously, you, you are probably one of the most important committees that, that I deal with. And I appreciate all the hard work. Uh, you know, I know we have a lot of team members that knew uh, into the insurance commissioner's office, uh, including myself. But uh, I really appreciate the, the uh, great deal of cooperation, a lot of great deal of counsel on, on how to approach the important legislation that you're facing. Uh, we, we have uh, obviously some ma major challenges, and, and, you're, and you are the forefront of those challenges. And I really appreciate the fact, you know, we, we're new uh, to state government, but we're not new to being a consumer, and we're not new to dealing with people. Uh, as a former police chief, as a, as a, as a military officer currently serving, I'm, I realize that what you do is, is the key to, as a police chief, I, I, majority of my issues were how do I take care of, of our police officers and our public servants. And insurance was always that part of that conversation. So I greatly appreciate, Mr. Chairman, I really appreciate the, the great uh, assistance that, that you and and your staff have given us to bring before you uh, a great deal, really important uh, bills that you all are considering today. We have our experts here that will be able to answer any questions you all may have. And I really appreciate the opportunity to come before you all and say hello and introduce myself briefly. I look forward to continuing to work. You will, you will get per periodic briefings from us, not just because the session is in, you will get periodic briefings from our agency throughout the year. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Thank you for being here with us today. Um, we have three bills on the agenda. Uh, we're going to uh, House Bill 1070, Representative Houston Gaines. We're going to go with that one first. We're waiting on something, uh, uh, update from Senate, on Senate Bill 188. So we'll give them a few minutes to get that to us. Uh, but if you would, uh, Representative Gaines, uh, come and uh, present that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. House Bill 1070 and LC 460313S is the LC we're working off of. <coughs> Due to ambiguity in the law, water damage claims in condominiums often result in confusion for all parties in regards to whether the unit owner's insurance policy or the condo association's insurance policy be primarily responsible to handle the claim. And in cases of water damage, as, as you likely know, time is critical uh, to prevent mold and, or additional damage to the property. So what this legislation is intended to do is assist both the unit owner and the condo association by providing a mechanism for each party to request in writing a copy of their certificate of insurance or the contact information of the assigned adjuster from the other party. By sharing this information, the goal is to facilitate communication between representatives for the unit owner and the condo association. And ultimately, this will help the party who is impacted by the damage get, the mov get movement on their claim in a faster manner. House Bill 1070 has been vetted by the Independent, in Independent Insurance Agents of Georgia and the Community Association Institute, as well as several property and casualty insurance companies. Basically, this bill just provides a new right to request and receive important information and is limited to water damage claims in condominium associations. John Barber is here with the Independent Insurance Agents, as well, if there's any questions. All right. Committee members, do we have any questions of the author? I see none. Is there anyone here in the audience who wishes to speak to the bill or has signed up for the bill? Seeing none, what's the will of the committee? I have a motion, do pass, and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? 
Bill passes. Very good, very good. Um, I don't know that we have that, uh, those papers here yet, but uh, we can, uh, this is a Senate bill which has already crossed over, so we will be able to take care of this one uh, later, but uh, since uh, the uh, author is here with us, uh, 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 well, I have you as representative, but I guess we'll call you Senator Walker. Please, okay. <laughs> please come to the podium and uh, uh, give us an overview of, of your bill and uh, tell us what we need to know about it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee. Mr. Chairman, it's a real pleasure to come before you. I haven't presented uh, in this committee with you as chairman, and I'm appreciative of your uh, long-time courtesies, and I look forward to working with you. I believe we have a copy of the original bill. There was, I understand that there's been some modifications, and that was what we were waiting on, but uh, for the sake of time this morning, we're just going to go ahead. So just Thank you, sir. reference the uh, LC number you have. All right. Us. It's Senate Bill 188, LC 46028S. And it's a, it's a very, this is a uh, NAIC update bill. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with the National Association of Insurance Commissioners and the uh, relationship Georgia has as an accredited state with NAIC. Uh, being an accredited state allows us to have essentially reci reci reciprocity uh, with other uh, states as far as uh, they acknowledge our regulation of, of their insurance companies and vice versa, so it makes the whole system work a lot better if you're an accredited state it's pretty critical to our whole insurance system because um, most most states are licensed in multiple states and they shouldn't have to be examined by multiple insurance commissioners it just would be redundant so in order to maintain our NAIC accreditation we have to adopt uh, the regulations of NAIC and that's what this bill uh, does uh, so it's a it's a Georgia De Insurance Department bill and it relates to the way we uh, account for reinsurance when evaluating the solvency of an insurance company so it's given credit when an insurance company lays off risk by purchasing reinsurance it gives them credit essentially on their balance sheet for uh, the reinsurance and the solvency examination of the insurance commissioner. All right. And, and Mr. Chairman, the reason we, we thought NAIC would have their rules finalized by the end of session last year, that's why we introduced it last year. We knew this was coming, and uh, they did not, by the time we adjourned, they had not finalized their rules, so we uh, ask that to be held and and that's why there's a substitute as the rules change slightly all right well as I said since we don't have the substitute yet this is something we can handle at a later date I just wanted to give you an opportunity to make a presentation on that we're not taking any action on this this morning so any questions uh, from the committee I see none thank you very much appreciate your time and representative Williams my good friend is gonna carry it over in the house for us all right very thank good you. thank you thank you all right, um, the next bill is uh, House Bill 1050, and I will be presenting that, so I'm going to turn this over to Vice Chairman Tarvin, and I'll go down there to do that. Uh, Chairman uh, Lumsden, uh, uh, you just uh, please uh, state the LC number and present your bill. This is House Bill 1050. We're working from LC 460295. Is that what you have in your packet? That's correct, sir. All right. Very good. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I bring to you uh, House Bill 1050. This is a department bill that um, comes as a priority for the Georgia Insurance Commissioner's Office. 
this bill is a um, model legislation from the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, and to date it's been adopted by 27 other states. For those of you who are not familiar with the Guarantee Fund, Guarantee Funds are state-based pools of money that are funded by assessments on insurers doing business in the state uh, to cover uh, consumers' claims when an insurer becomes insolvent. Uh, most, uh, most states have both um, property and casualty guarantee funds as well as separate life and health uh, guarantee funds. Uh, this particular bill deals with uh, the Life and Health uh, Guarantee Association of Georgia. Um, recent um, uh, insolvencies uh, in the long-term care industry have begun putting some pressure on uh, state life and health insurance guarantee funds and uh, have exposed uh, I issues with their structure. Um, for instance, in Georgia, major medical providers are only writing 2% of the long-term care premium, but cover approximately 80% of the assessment shares. So this model act makes uh, two major changes to Georgia's uh, life and uh, health guarantee fund. It adds HMOs to the fund to broaden the base uh, or, to, or to broaden the assessment base. Uh, they previously have been exempt. So this brings HMOs into the mix, and it uh, splits future assessments 50-50 uh, for uh, long-term care insurer insolvencies uh, equally between the uh, Guarantee Association's life member insurers and health member insurers. Uh, life insurance companies voluntarily agreed to accept this 50-50 uh, split to help stabilize the market. Now, these changes are necessary to broaden the base of assessment uh, in the assessment pool uh, in the event of uh, future long-term care insolvencies. Many states, or some states, have already um, experienced this. In 2017, uh, Penn Treaty was liquidated with uh, obligations of over $4 billion uh, and only uh, $700 million in assets. So member insurers were eventually assessed over $70, uh, 70 million million to cover those. So uh, adding the uh, HMO to the guarantee fund also protects their consumers as well. Uh, the current system leaves HMO policy uh, holders and providers uh, without the same protection as commercial members in the event of an insolvency. Uh, the difference between the commercial health insurer and the HMOs that uh, led to the HMOs being excluded years ago uh, from the fund no longer exist. So these entities now uh, compete actively in the health coverage marketplace. In fact, most of the uh, commercial health insurers now have HMO platforms as well. So this is a model act that uh, expands the uh, board of the uh, Georgia Life and Health Insurance Guarantee Association, and it adds new seats to the uh, HMO members. As I said, 27 states have already adopted this. This is the model legislation. That is an overview of the bill I have with me from the Department of Insurance, uh, Wes uh, Burleson, who can uh, speak to details, um, and I will turn it over to him at, at this time. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, as the Chairman said, this is a, a national model legislation. Um, life insurers, health insurers, um, regulators all came together to, to work out this compromise. Um, and I think, believe it passed in 2018, and since then, uh, 27 states have already passed it. Uh, we have a few folks here that uh, want to present uh, a little more information for you all. Uh, Nick Thompson with United Healthcare, I believe, has a uh, presentation that, that I believe was handed out to everyone that can kind of walk you through the history of this one. This is necessary. And then Frank Knighton, the executive director from Georgia's Guarantee Fund, is here to answer any more specific questions about, you know, the makeup of, of the board and, and um, you know, specifics um, among how the association works and, and what the, what these changes are, are doing. Um, so with that, if, if you're ready for Nick Thompson to come. Sure. Okay. Mr. Chairman, with your permission, I ask for Nick Thompson to come to the podium and make the presentation. Right. Ms. Thompson, uh, state your name and uh, who you're with. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Nick Thompson. I am a senior vice president with United Healthcare and uh, I want to thank you for allowing me a few minutes to make a presentation to you all. I always hate to, to work from the PowerPoint, but this one seems to be the best way to do something as complicated as this issue. While it's pretty simple, uh, it's complicated about how we got to where we are. 
if you go to the first page of the PowerPoint after the, uh, the cover page, you'll see that you know, long-term care and the Accountable Care Act has created a perfect storm. We've had simultaneous insolvencies over the past few years. Penn Treaty, uh, as the chairman just mentioned, uh, was declared insolvent in 2017. And uh, uh, along around the same time, we had some co-ops across the country that were formed under the Accountable Care Act uh, that are covered by guarantee associations also become insolvent. And the pressure that these insolvencies have placed on the guarantee system uh, have been significant, and it's created a capacity problem. The ability of the guarantee association to assess the member companies, its assessment base, to ensure it's got enough money to pay claims of the policyholders of the insolvent insurance companies. And uh, in the co-op circumstance in particular, the GAs, the, uh, the one out in uh, Nebraska, had to borrow money from the industry in order to be able to pay the claims. And that capacity problem is, is real. If we could, let's go to page three. Nationally, long-term care riders are not subject to a majority of the assessments for a long-term care insolvency. And there's a reason for that. And the reason is that it, if we just assessed long-term care companies for a long-term care insolvency, we wouldn't have the capacity to pay the claims. So we've got to have the entire industry step in and make sure that there is a sufficient assessment base for us to take care of our most vulnerable senior citizens, these long-term care policy holders. This is a serious issue around this country, and it's one that we in the health industry and the life industry recognized was going to probably be worse if we didn't step up to the table and try to, to, to address it and to fix it. So um, if we go to page four, you'll see that um, in Georgia, uh, the numbers track pretty much the same the way they do across the United States. And, and that is that the majority of the assessments for long-term care liability is placed on health insurance, but not the entire health market, just the indemnity carriers, not the HMOs. And the information that I have about Georgia is that uh, the HMOs may have the largest share of the health market in the state of Georgia now. And so that's a major capacity that's not available to our guarantee association uh, to assess the monies necessary to pay the claims for these long-term care policyholders. If you turn to page five of the, the PowerPoint, this is just another, another graph that shows you roughly 55% of the national premiums uh, of the members in a guarantee association are excluded from being assessed. That's the capacity problem. And the way these mechanisms work, just like high-risk pools or reinsurance pools, is that the industry, the entire industry, supports these mechanisms. And that's what uh, we're doing here with respect to the fact that uh, now the life industry and the health industry, including those of us who write HMOs, my company, we have HMOs all over the country. We don't think it's right to exclude them from the assessment capacity when we participate in the same marketplace. You see on page six, uh, national numbers, 79% of guarantee association premiums of member companies are excluded from assessments. That just won't get it for us. So next page, you see that the current long-term care assessment mechanism distorts our markets and really it penalizes our, our policyholders. The current system, uh, as we saw from the recent co-op insolvency, demonstrate the need for addition, additional assessment capacity with the accident and the health account. We've got to have a greater source of revenue to pay these claims of the insolvent carriers. And then Penn Treaty put pressure. Penn Treaty is the largest health insurance insolvency in the history of the country. The largest insolvency is a life insurance company. Um, so Penn Treaty is not the largest long-term carrier out there and may not uh, hold its record as being the second largest insolvency for very long. And we're trying to get ahead of that trend and get ahead of that problem. In California, uh, which I chair, I'm the chairman of the board of the California Guarantee Association, we are seeing our a capacity further erode 
uh, as a real result of this dichotomy where HMOs are not part of the guarantee system. In fact, in California, over the last three years, we have lost a quarter of our assessment capacity because of the movement in the marketplace from indemnity health insurers over to HMOs. Go over to the next page. Uh, we went to the life industry and we explained to them that we were very much concerned about what we saw coming down the track if we didn't address this capacity issue. Um, we gave reasons about how the health industry is unduly impacted as a result of the ACA and I'm happy to report that the life industry recognized these concerns and immediately agreed to pick up 50 percent of the assessment for a long-term care insurance insolvency. So that solves our capacity problem and it solves it in two ways. One, all health insurers, whether HMOs or indemnity, are now in the tent so the entire health market will participate in protecting our senior citizens for long-term care. Same thing happens on the life side. The reason we did 50-50 is because long-term care is so large. If we don't have a balance coming from both life and annuity and from health, one line or the other is going to wind up having the, assist, uh, the capacity problem that exists today on the health side. And that's why the two industries came together and decided 50-50 was the right way to go. It's the way to protect our state-based guarantee system, and we believe it protects state-based regulation of insurance. Um, we also think that HMO members deserve guarantee association coverage. Uh, as Chairman mentioned a minute ago, when HMOs originally became uh, uh, entities that could be licensed in the states, they were different animals. As a result of the ACA today, consumers don't know the difference. They don't know if they're buying an HMO product or an indemnity product. All the products are the same. The federal government pretty much sets what all the benefits are. So it doesn't seem to us to be the right thing to do uh, to say if you're an HMO enrollee and your HMO is insolvent and you've had to go out and network for care in an emergency situation and there's no guarantee fund to help you that you're going to have to pay that bill. And we don't think it's fair for the provider community to have to pay it because uncompensated care is passed along to the rest of the marketplace. So that's why we think bringing HMOs into the fold is the answer. Uh, and it's important and it's time to do it. Now the NEIC uh, moved on this compromise in record time. Literally within about seven or eight months, uh, they adopted these provisions. And I'm happy to tell you that that happened in 2017. And since then, I stand here today, we've got 28 states that have adopted this model. Um, so the rest of the country, I think, is, is seeing the issue and getting the message. And we think that this is the right way to ensure we can protect our most vulnerable senior citizens. We can protect uh, the viability of our state-based guarantee system and ultimately state-based regulation of insurance. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Yes, uh, thank you, Ms. Thompson. Uh, Representative Williamson. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Thompson, thank you for your presentation. It would have been a little bit more helpful if this um, PowerPoint had been in, in a format that you could differentiate between the colors. Uh, these, these grays, I don't know about any other members, it's very difficult to determine what the uh, which uh, percentage of the pie charts or, or which line. Uh, that being said, you mentioned in on page six that 79% of Georgia premiums are excluded from assessments. Can, can you help me understand what, that's virtually 80% of the market, what, 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 who are the companies collecting 80% of the premium that are excluded? Is that the ERISA plans or what, what makes up that 80%? No, sir, that, that uh, would be health maintenance organizations that are writing business in the state so, when you look at premium volume. So HMOs account for 80% uh, of the premiums that are excluded from assessment in, by themselves? No, sir, 62. Well, it's what, about half the market, roughly, well, of, then of the, the, the commercial what, market. What, what composes the 79%? So if it's 62, what's the other 17%? Well, I don't, 
Well, I don't know where six. you're getting the, the page oh, you're, you're looking at the top of page. Yes, yeah, says 79% uh, that, of Georgia premiums are excluded from assessments. That would include life, annuity, and HMO. So there are life contracts that are being excluded from assessments? Yes, sir, for long-term care. And, That's and, what this point and is they're about. The, okay, so and they're the ones voluntarily coming into it? Yes, sir. And, okay, all right. So it's just a little bit unclear on that. Um, and you, you mentioned there's fundamental changes in the HMOs who historically were excluded from coverage um, from these guarantee funds. Clarify a little bit more for us what, what's changed that made them uh, suddenly need to be covered. In the early days when the HMOs were promoted under a federal law, the way they were set up is that you only had coverage if you were in a network. In other words, if you went out of network, you wouldn't have any coverage. Well, today, uh, HMOs and indemnity companies, their products are, are identical in the way in which they function. Uh, indemnity carriers have networks, and uh, you get one level of coverage of reimbursement if you go in network versus a different level if you go out of network. Now, HMOs are doing the same thing. Uh, rather than uh, under the old uh, way of doing things, if you were in an HMO, you could only go to the network of providers. Today, in an HMO, you can go outside the network. And uh, the benefits, pardon? That would be under a point of service. Yes, sir. Well, uh, th there are some that are true HMOs where you don't go out of network, but the majority of the products, as we understand it, is you are allowed to go out of network. And you, uh, even if you're not allowed to go out of network, you could have an emergency uh, that could occur anywhere in the country and you would be out of network. The HMO is required to cover it, but if it's insolvent and it can't pay for it, uh, that's your responsibility as a patient. So just, just one follow-up question, Mr. Chairman, if you don't mind. And thank you, Representative mm -hmm. Williams, because that's kind of the line of thought I was going down as well. Um, so just to, just to be clear, um, there are uh, this, this willing partnership between life insurers who have historically enjoyed benefits for their policyholders under these guarantee funds, as well as the uh, traditional life insurance companies, the non-HMO footprint. So is the, are the H, is the HMO community nationwide uh, willingly uh, agree into this tax because it is in fact the tax these are state associated funds that are taxing uh, premium payers at the, at the end of the day all everything comes back to the household paying the paying the coverage yes sir for the premium are they willingly coming into this um, arrangement yes sir I represent a coalition of the major medical health insurer riders around the country. Talk about HMOs are willingly all, coming in. All of whom, all of us have HMOs. And uh, if we are going to be competing in a marketplace where an HMO is exempt from this assessment, but our indemnity business is not, then uh, that is a public policy that would encourage us to move our business off the indemnity platform onto the HMO platform to get out from under paying these assessments because we have to compete in the marketplace and we have to pay the same sorts of benefits and taxes that others pay. And if that incentive is for us to write our business on a platform where we don't have to pay assessments, then we've just made the capacity problem that much worse uh, in order to have a funding base to protect our senior citizens in long-term care. We don't think that's the right way to go and that's why we are advocating that our HMOs be brought into uh, this. We have significant HMOs around the country writing business. California, in fact, being one of the states. And we see what's happening in California, and we are advocating that California adopt this same NEIC model so that our Guarantee Association doesn't have a capacity problem and that we can protect these senior citizens. Just one final question, Mr. Chairman. One final question. So, well, one final question, uh, and because I don't know the answer to this. What percentage, in your best guess, percentage of national HMOs are for profit? Of the member, uh, covered members nationwide, what percentage of that overarching HMO footprint is are for profit companies? I couldn't tell you that. That's okay. a kind of a state by state basis. Okay. Thank you. 
Representative Shannon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just sort of a follow-up question. Representative Williams asked a few of the questions that I wanted to ask. Um, I'm surprised to hear the HMOs are not a part of the guarantee as assessment, not having to pay into that. And I think a lot of consumers would be surprised if they knew that, and they should care because it absolutely can affect consumers. Um, but just to clarify, you're saying that the reason the HMOs were initially excluded was because they used to be much more of a closed system. That was the reason that they were initially excluded in the beginning? In the beginning because they have contracts with their providers that mm -hmm. say in the event they're insolvent, the provider uh, has to look to the HMO only. Mm -hmm. And if there's not money to pay the bill, the provider doesn't get paid. So that translates to uncompensated care. You know, that means that it goes out somewhere else and the money comes in to take care of it in some other fashion if the provider isn't paid. Well, thank you for the presentation because, I mean, the HMOs do compete just like any other health care plan. And when consumers look at it, they do just look at if their doctor is in network. That's pretty much what they care about. And so, yeah, I appreciate your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Gamble. Thank you for your presentation today. Um, I'm curious to know how many insolvencies have actually affected Georgia? Frank may know that better than I. Thank you. Representative Hughley. Mr. Chairman, thank, thank you for the presentation. At the end of the day, um, if we don't do this, what effect will that have on the consumer? Because that is, that is what this is all about. What is it going to mean to the consumer? And uh, I, I hear my colleagues talking about, yes, it's going to be a tax on the companies, but we need to bring the conversation back to the consumer. What, what will this mean uh, to consumers here in Georgia if we do this or as opposed if we don't do it? If we don't ensure that we have sufficient enough capacity to assess the industry, to pay the claims, we could be faced with a situation where we have a large insolvency in long-term care and we will not have the ability to assess the requisite amount of money that we need to pay claims. And so ultimately that could translate into claims not getting paid. So what you're saying is I have a long-term care policy that I've been paying on for 20 years and now I need to use it. The company doesn't have the money and I'm just left out there. If, you don't, if we don't have the capacity to take care of that. That's, That's what we're saying. Yes, ma'am. I mean, these guarantee associations, we are FDIC uh, that, that's available for banks. That's what we do for insurance companies. Thank you. Representative Williams, it's, oh. it's your turn. Oh, thank, thank you. Is my, yeah, okay. I've got a question for you. How are captives involved in this we're starting to see a lot of groups major medical health insurance plans go toward captives would captives be excluded in this scenario um i i think the answer is they would be excluded and the reason is um this is a changing landscape that we don't know fully yet where it'll come out to but generally a captive writes the business for a its captive business as an employer. It is not a, uh, a company that's in the marketplace marketing to all citizens. Okay, one follow-up on that is any idea how much money we're talking about that all of these insurance carriers are going to pony up and put into the fund because I see it as starting to see instead of 25% increases with my Blue Crosses or my Uniteds, I'm going to start seeing 28 or 30% to help fund this. Is that a fair assessment? No, uh, I wouldn't say so because now it depends on what line of business you're speaking of. If, if I'm talking about the health insurance line okay, right so, here. So all, automatically the health line liability is cut in half by virtue of life and annuity picking up half the tab. So you cut it in half immediately. You bring HMOs in, and let's just do simple math, you cut that half by another half. So actually it, it will go down. 
Well, one more. Well, you know, when you're talking the well, when you're talking the HMOs, you're talking United, you're talking Blue Cross, you're talking Kaiser, yes, Humana, yes, sir, Aetna. Mm-hmm. And so, how much how much money are we talking? Any idea? Any guesstimate? I don't have dollars of the market. Okay. In Georgia, I'm sorry, I do not have that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we we we're going to you know we're down to about 25 minutes, and we got plenty two more uh, people who want to speak. Uh, we're going to cut this off after this. So, uh, Representative Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I was just going to simply ask if someone can explain what captives was for those of us who are not in the a, a, insurance. A captive. a captive would be like uh, you sold for, I'm, I'm just going to throw a big red out here, you sold for State Farm and that you were a captive agent to State Farm. You're not an independent or selling for multiple. If that's not correct with somebody. Okay, you like that. Okay. Does that answer your question, Reverend David? Thank you. Okay. I'm sorry, I, I, I had a different understanding when no. I answered the question. Okay, go ahead, I'm Chairman. sorry. I, I just, a, a captive uh, to me is when a large company like GE uh, forms a captive offshore, more and more they're oh. doing it in the country, I and apologize. they put all of their liabilities into their captive that they manage. So they are self-insuring through a captive mechanism. I stand corrected on what? <coughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mr. Thompson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Potter. If you would state your name and yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and members of the committee. I am Bobby Potter, and I stand before you on behalf of the American Council of Life Insurers today. They have 280 member companies representing about 94 percent of the industry assets. On behalf of ACLI, we are fully supportive of House Bill 1050, as is without amendments. You have heard the history and somewhat in the weeds, it's, it's, some, it's uh, technical beyond my expertise, but you've heard the reasons for it and the reasons for an NAIC Model Act. Uh, several highlights that I would note relative to what Nick Thompson has just presented. As I understand it, there are very few insurers actually in the health uh, side of the house or in the life insurance side of the market that actually writes or wrote long-term care insurance. There are fewer now than there were before. As it is right now, and I think the question was asked what would happen now if there's an, an insolvency of one of these, as I understand it now, there would be essentially roughly an 80%, 20% split between health insurers with the 80% and life insurers who have some uh, capacity to write health. That will be the split. Despite the vast majority of life insurers who do not write long-term care insurance, the life industry has agreed to contribute 50% on this 50-50 basis to stabilize the guarantee mechanisms, not just in Georgia, but around the country. And as, as you have heard from Mr. Thompson, HMOs are included as part of that in this bill. They're included as member insurers by definition. Hence, they would be required to pay into the assessment to broaden the base, but they're <coughs> also a part, their participants are part of that in the event of an insolvency. So this bill would treat all of those folks funding health care equally. <coughs> you, have heard, I expect, and would likely hear that Kaiser, as an HMO in Georgia, uh, would seek an exemption or a 75-25 split. Uh, I would tell you all that that would upend the compromise that has existed, that has now been um, embraced in what I thought was 27, maybe 28 states. Um, there are certainly there were, there were similar efforts in other states for a 75-25 split uh, from Kaiser. I would ask that you resist that. Um, I think their indication would be that, that, that they weren't in it before and that they have nothing to do with long-term care insurance. I would just remind you that neither did a majority of the health insurers. They didn't write this. Neither did a majority of the life insurers. This is really an industry solution that was crafted by folks at the NAIC, the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, which includes our commissioner who stood up before you earlier, 
and folks engaged in this process to find an industry solution to a problem that may be coming down the road relative to insolvencies. So the life insurers have stepped up. The health coalition that you referenced, that Nick Thompson referenced, has stepped up, and many of those po folks in the health coalition, household names, uh, also have HMOs as he has described. So from our perspective, we endorse this bill, thank the chairman, and we would ask that you give a favorable resolution to House Bill 1050. I right, thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm going to just take a couple of questions. Uh, Chairman Clark. Uh, yes. When, when dealing with the long-term care, is, are the people writing and underwriting these policies, are they increasing their premiums knowing that the, the cost of is going up? That, like, are they trying to address it on their own on some level, too, to make sure that, that they're remaining solvent? On their own. So I'm, <coughs> I'm, <coughs> your your question is, is, is somewhat in the weeds for me, and I'm going to step out on some of this. But as I understand it, yes, uh, what the information provided to me was just some few years ago there were a hundred folks writing long-term care insurance. That is down to about ten or twelve. So, and part of that reason is there was some annuity, there were some actuary projections some years ago that simply did not work out, which has caused this kind of crisis in the long-term care world. But part of the solution of those who are writing it has been to raise premiums to try to cover their ultimate cost. And fewer people um, lapsed their policies than they expected actuarially over time. So that's part of what has created the crisis. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Potter. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have one more. Frank Knighton, who is with us, is also uh, over the uh, uh, Guarantee Association. I think he has some uh, some comments that needed to be made before we go further. Uh, Mr. Chairman, committee, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I just wanted to make one uh, correction. Let, let, me, let me state your name and oh, who you're with so we can Frank, hear you. Frank, my name is Frank Knighton, and I'm with the, I'm the executive director of the Georgia Life and Health Insurance Guarantee Association and the uh, Georgia Insolvency Pool, which is the PNC equivalent of the Life and Health. And early on, I uh, made a comment that we had had 62 uh, Life and Health Insolvencies. We've actually had 73 Life and Health, health Insolvencies, and the 38 is correct. We are still administering 38 of those insolvencies that are active. But a question was raised, and I just wanted to share this information. A question was raised about the premium, I think, from the HMO community, and the based on the 2018 annual filings, uh, uh, I have numbers here that that uh, direct premium was uh, approximately $15 billion. So that $15 billion is not a part of the assessment base. Thank you. Thanks, sir. No questions. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Sheriff Smith, state your name and... Good morning. Good morning. I'm Shay Ross Smith with Kaiser Permanente. I have with me as well, that's probably going to come speak with me, um, Kirk McGee, Vice President, Regional Counsel of the Kaiser Foundation Health Plan of Georgia. I just want to start by thanking the committee for having us today and for letting us come speak. Um, Kaiser is here in opposition to this legislation. We are an HMO in Georgia. I know we've heard a lot of information about HMOs, being a part of this conversation, being a part of a conversation before this legislation was dropped and how all the HMOs are on board with this bill and the inclusion in this legislation and the 50-50 split in this legislation. And I'm here to say that that's not true. We are the largest HMO in the state. Um, Kaiser's information that we have on the HMO market in the state of Georgia is the HMO market takes up about 10% of the insurance market in the state. 80% of that 10% is Kaiser, um, Kaiser Permanente business HMO plans um, I do want to take a look at the legislation itself um, I know that a lot of people have already come before me and have said you know we are including HMOs in this bill this is the fair thing to do and in fact the term health maintenance organization HMO is what I'm referring to um, appears 15 times in this legislation um, if you look at lines <coughs> 
129 through 133. Um, again, I'm working off of LC 460295. Um, this section is the exception section. Um, on line 100, except, it says, you know, except as otherwise provided in the subsection of this code section. And if you go down to line 131, um, it excludes self-funded insurance plans, lines of business from this, um, from this fund, from the Guarantee Association Fund. Kaiser has significant concerns that self-funded plans are not included in this legislation. 98% um, of Kaiser's business is fully funded business. Um, so not only are they including HMOs, including Kaiser specifically into this tax, but they are also including us disproportionately because the way our business is set up, that we have more fully funded business than self-funded business. And that's a significant concern to us um, with this legislation. Um, we have, you know, been in discussions with members of this committee. We've been in discussions um, with other lobbyists in support of this, and we're still trying to find and reach the policy rationale for changing the Guarantee Association Fund. I believe earlier a gentleman spoke that there have been 62 insolvencies in the state of Georgia um, that have been handled, what I would say, you know, by this fund as is before these changes were made, and we're unsure why these changes actually need to be made. Um, if HMOs were included in only health insurance insolvencies, then that would be a different type of conversation, but including us in the long-term care insurance insolvencies, which is a business that we do not sell, um, that, again, is very concerning to us to have this new tax put on us and put on our members. So I know that there was a question earlier about the consumers and how this affects consumers. Um, if you look at lines, I want to make sure I'm telling you right, 830 through 833, as well as lines 1004 through 1011. Let me turn and get there as well. This language direct, directly speaks to how members will be taxed from this uh, Guarantee Association Fund as well. The legislation explicitly permits insurers and health maintenance organizations to, um, to consider premium surcharges when an insolvency occurs to recoup some of the funds, some of this tax that we have um, giving into this fund. And I have concerns that members of a health insurance company, members of Kaiser Permanente, will be paying for a for-profit long-term care insurer that goes insolvent. That's concerning to Kaiser, that's concerning to me that that's a policy standard that we're setting the state with this uh, legislation. I think the crux of this bill that we've talked about and that's been spoken about um, already today is the 50-50 split. Um, that language is on line 776 through 781. Get there as well. If you look at this language, it talks about Class B assessment for long-term care insur insurance. This 50-50 split is specific to long-term care insolvencies. This has nothing to do with if a health insurer goes insolvent. Again, health insurers are writing 2% of the long-term care insurance business in the state. I think that was stated earlier um, when the department was um, presenting with Chairman Lumsden. Um, I will restate again that Kaiser Permanente sells none of this business in the state, um, yet we will be subject to be a part of this 50% um, assessment tax allocation when a long-term care insurer goes insolvent. Um, I just, I understand, you know, the committee wants to do what's right for members of long-term care insurers, um, and Kaiser by no means supports these members not having the ability to recoup funds when a company that they put um, their trust into goes insolvent, and I understand that. Um, but taxing other members, other insurance members, people who are making the right decision by having health insurers to cover for-profit businesses making um, poor business decisions and going insolvent is very uncomfortable to us at Kaiser Permanente. Um, with me, I have Kirk McGee. He, again, he's the vice president and regional counsel for the Kaiser Foundation Health Plan of Georgia. Um, he's going to come up and speak kind of to who Kaiser is, the history. But, but did, is, did he sign the, I'm not trying to cut you off, but did, okay. did he sign the list to speak? We, we're well, a, bit, a little bit of on a timeline, and I'm not trying to cut you off. That's but okay. 
But uh, it was my intention that we were going to sit together originally and testify okay. together. I'm, I'm going to give him just a couple of minutes because I that. and uh, and uh, I understand, but I'm I'm sorry we had the list and usually we don't defer from this, but that that's fine. I will I'll allow it just for a couple of minutes. I really appreciate that. There there were there were no you had no questions so far. Great, and if there are questions that you can address those, if, to if, and I if there are the questions, I'll, I will let them ask them. Awesome, thank, thank you. you. Would you state your name and. Sure. <clears throat> My name is Kirk McGee. I'm the regional counsel for Kaiser Permanente of Georgia, and I appreciate your indulgence, yes, uh, Mr. Chairman. I want to talk to you a little bit about the policies that you are doing. It is the right thing to try to cover long-term care. That We work in a, a, a disjointed market in health care and life insurance, and so we have to do things. But there's also a policy that I want you all to look at. Kaiser Permanente is a 501c3 uh, corporation. We are a not-for-profit there is a special design and intent for what we do, and we, su we serve a special purpose in the healthcare market. There was a, some discussion about what HMOs started out to be. We are still that. We don't have networks. All the doctors at Kaiser Permanente are Kaiser Permanente people. They are employees. We don't have networks. That we have all that liability. We're not passing liability on to doctors. That is our liability. We, have, we pay extra money into that to have a risk-based capital to make sure that we have enough money. But here's the policy that we're saying. If you have a 501c3, which is intended to do charitable work, it, as we are, this is what we do. $66 million in Georgia alone for things like this. These aren't what other insurance companies are doing. So for example, when the economy changed and jobs were lost, we provided scholarships and health care to women in particular, to be able to transition out of old economies into new economies. We, suck, we serve uh, people in food deserts. We have supported the Beltline so that children don't have to cross the street or, or go up, uh, outside of their neighborhood so that they can have health care and exercise in their neighborhoods. We do things like this, free care. We support free clinics around this state. A lot of things like that to support the safety net. That is the special purpose. So what we're saying is, this is, we get the idea that you wanna add HMOs. The question for us is, are you also respecting the policy of not-for-profit HMOs such as us, who do some additional things that support the burden of the state government, which is what we're charged to do? So that's what we ask, that there might be some consideration of that. Not that we oppose the policy of trying to cover everybody. You have a complicated job. But that is also a policy that you are charged to look at. And that's what we would ask you to do, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Uh, there, I see no questions. Uh, of course, uh, does anybody have any questions for the presenter from the committee? I see no questions. Uh, What's the will of the committee? Do we have a motion to move to pass? We have a motion to pass. We have a second. second. We have a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed. You know the you know the what to do. Go to Chairman Smith and get your paperwork filled out. Thank you, committee members. Appreciate uh, it. You got you guys kind of hang uh, loose next Wednesday morning because it's the day before crossover. We may have a meeting, we may not, but just stay tuned. Thank everyone. Thank the presenters. <laughs>